Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back for the second day of the O'Grain Conference. Uh, we are going to get started in a couple of minutes. So if you can uh, grab some breakfast, if you're in the breakfast line, grab a cup of coffee. I have another great day of uh, programming for you all. Um, great speakers, great topics. All right, you quiet down quickly. <laughs> um, again, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I am Erin Silva. I am a professor at UW-Madison. I'm also an extension funded faculty. And in that capacity, I have the pleasure to manage the O'Grain program in partnership with my incredible team that are at the registration table um, and have uh, really put together this uh, wonderful event. I, I couldn't do it without the people that are working with me and, and supporting uh, the work that we do with, with O'Grain. Um, in that um, uh, spirit, um, I know we have a day ahead of us, so there's plenty of time to do this, but I, I do want to note that there are evaluations on each of the tables. And we do change this conference a little bit every year, depending on your feedback. Um, this is a first year at this venue. We've always had it on campus. Um, but as we've gotten bigger, we've hit a record number of uh, attendees this year. I think we have over 275. So O'Grain is growing, and our community is growing. Um, it's a good thing we, we move venues. But we're curious to hear how the experience was for you in this venue. Um, we're uh, always wanting feedback. One of the changes that we've made over the years is to put more time in for networking, have longer breaks, have more time to visit exhibitors and sponsors, um, and to have uh, round tables and time to get to know each other. So if there are suggestions you have in terms of structure, topics, speakers, we really take those to heart. And also any other suggestions you have for us in terms of what we can do to support you. So we have our annual conference. We also have field days. Um, we have virtual workshops. Shops. And if there's things that we can do as a land grant university and as a university extension program throughout our many partnerships, again, we, we couldn't do this alone. And even within this conference, we have partnerships, particularly with Artists and Grain Collaborative. And I want to give a big shout out and hand to Alyssa Hartman and her leadership with Artists and Grain Collaborative. Um, amazing group. The partnership with Alyssa, uh, partnerships with uh, uh, Michael Field Agricultural Institute, another amazing group that we've been working with some mentoring programs and, and research. Um, Albert Lee Seed, again, another critical sponsor of this conference. Um, so, so many partnerships. Uh, but within those partnerships, too, if, if we can support programming, mentorships, field days, workshops, if there are certain fact sheets, um, really want to know what we can do to, to support you, to provide more information and research projects as well, always wanting to make sure that our research is answering farmer questions um, and that we're helping you make your operations more profitable and productive um, and, and reach the goals that you have as organic farmers. So anyway, long, long-winded, but please fill out the evaluations because they really, really mean a lot to us. Um, just again, thank our partners with this conference, um, Artisan Grain Collaborative, Art, uh, Albert Lee Seed, um, and everyone that's made this, this possible and, and the wonderful people here at the Monona Terrace uh, facility as well. Just a couple of notes. I think I mentioned this yesterday, but for those that didn't catch it, unfortunately, one of our keynote speakers that was supposed to speak yesterday, Wendy Johnson, um, is ill. So we are adjusting our schedule a bit. So we're not going to have an afternoon keynote. Klaus gave an amazing keynote yesterday. Um, so instead, we're going to just move that afternoon up. So um, we're going to take uh, the uh, concurrent sessions and move them into the keynote slot, and then subsequently also move the last uh, concurrent sessions into what was the first concurrent session slot. So we could either wrap up a little early, get you on the road a little bit early. The other thing that we were thinking of doing is just having kind of a group closing session and having it more as a troubleshooting session, kind of a wrap up, reflections on the conference, kind of brainstorm together. If you have a, a pressing problem on your farm, Canada Thistle, <laughs> we can brainstorm together how to solve some of those issues. Um, so just a thing to be aware of um, on the uh, agenda, change in the agenda today. Um, Trying to think if there's any other announcements. I'm sure I'll think of more throughout the day, but I think those are some, some critical things as we uh, get into our um, second day of programming. 
um, just another round of thank yous. Just thank you all um, again for um, contributing to the, the spirit of the conference, the spirit of sharing and um, uh, sharing knowledge, um, sharing experiences, and a big part of, I think, what makes this uh, conference a community what it is. And one of the reasons why I've always loved organic agriculture is um, the amazing community of sharing and, and trying to help each other and lift each other up as an organic community. So thank you all for um, your, your willingness to, to share and contribute to the, the event. So um, yesterday, we kicked off the agenda um, with uh, one of the critical topics in organic, which is markets and prices. Um, and similarly, um, we are going to kick off today with another critical topic in organic weed management. Um, as organic farmers, I don't think that uh, we're uh, quite uh, tackle the issue of uh, managing weeds. So it's always something that we're looking for great speakers to present um, their perspectives, um, particularly as we look at ecological solutions for weed management. So we're thrilled this year. I think this might be the first time we're actually bringing in an international flavor to the conference. And we have a um, speaker from Canada, Steve Shirtliff. Uh, Steve grew up on a farm in Manitoba and is now a professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Saskatchewan. His position involves teaching, research, and extension in the areas of crop imaging, weed control, and agronomy. In the mid-2000s, he spent a sabbatical year at UW-Madison. I didn't realize that. <laughs> so he's been here at UW-Madison. Past and current research projects have focused on pulse agronomy, non-herbicidal weed control, as phenotypic and agronomic applications of crop imaging using UAV and satellite imagery. And he has a wide range of interests and collaborates widely with computer scientists, plant breeders, geographers, economists, soil scientists, and engineers to form dynamic research groups to tackle interdisciplinary problems. So um, we are thrilled to have Dr. Shirtliff here. And let me transition, see if I can, oh my goodness. All right. All right, please join me in welcoming Dr. Shirtliff. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, and thank you for inviting me down here. And uh, yeah, back to Madison. I spent a year down here, a very formative time in uh, my, myself and my family's life. We came down here with uh, three little daughters that were, you know, I think the ages uh, three. Oh, no, it would have been, uh, no, not even, like one and a half, one and a half, three and uh, four going on five down here. So we spent a year down here and got to experience this. And you know, we, home, we came close to staying. There were some positions coming up that we considered, but we never, never quite made it. So this is kind of maybe an alternative looking back at, you know, there's those little, there's those little places in your life where you could have, where, you know, where there are these things that could have been, you know, this uh, could have, you know, kind of could have been, but it's great to be here. Uh, you know, I've been talking to some farmers here. One thing I've learned in my life is that farmers are, you know, approachable, great people all over the world. And it's uh, always great to talk to them and get their perspectives on problems and stuff like that. I've been doing research in organic agriculture since I think I was trying to think of it today, whether it was 01 or 02 I started. So it's been over 20 years. You know, there's some of the names up here are some of the people that have come through the the lab over the year that have, and many have gone on to, to better things, you know, have worked in kind of the area, you know, uh, uh, Eric Johnson is a good colleague of mine. I'll bring it up again and again. Chris Willenberg is now my department head and boss, but he originally worked with us back in the day, you know, uh, uh, Dilshan Benargama is a professor at the University of Manitoba, and there's, and there's a lot of people have come through the lab. But anyways, we're not here to me to talk about my people. We're here to talk about how to control weeds and small grains. And so where am I from? Where am I from? I'm from up north in Saskatchewan. Um, in this day, at this day, uh, when the, our local, when papers were still published, well, this paper is still around, uh, January 29th, 2004, it was actually the coldest place on earth that day. So it gets cold where we're from. 
But, you know, and uh, so we don't usually put this up when we're trying to recruit people to come up there and work. Uh, but but maybe we might put up this one that because last week uh, in uh, a, a town in Saskatchewan was actually warmer than Key West, Florida in a strange. You know, str we're having the same kind of winter you guys are having down here. Just like incredibly. We got cold for a week and a half and it's just been hot, been warm. You know, it's been above zero. You know, we don't have any snow left. It's. A little bit scary, but I'm not here to talk about that. Uh, so where are we? I'll have to see. Can I point? Maybe I'll point with the with a pointer here. You guys, can you guys see that pointer? Oh no, you can't. Um, let's see if we can make this work. Laser pointer. There we go. This this trapezoidal uh, shape place in the middle of the continent here, this is Saskatchewan. And uh, to use an old joke of mine, it's easy to draw, but hard to spell. <laughs> yeah, the south half of the province is basically all crops and pasture. The north half is all forest and lakes and trees. So that's kind of what we're looking at. It's a big place. We have about 42% of Canada's farmland. Uh, I think 45 million acres, something like that. Our main crops are wheat, canola, barley, oat, lentil, pea, and flax, all small grains. So that's, we, there's a little bit of corn production uh, for silage mostly that uh, it doesn't, and the reason why is it uh, corn needs a long, a longer, a long warm growing season with good precipitation. And typically the areas that we're dealing with, this, this part up here closer to the forest, gets reasonable moisture and it's cooler. So this is like where, where oats are grown, kind of this area up in here. Uh, and canola grown along here and uh, wheat is grown everywhere. More germ in the, in the south, in the south and southwest. But uh, yeah, but it's just not, it's, we're just not warm enough uh, in the summertime, and especially our nights tend to get cool. So you don't get that growth uh, in the, those crops. So that's what we, so we, the crops we grow are small grains. There was a real push in the 1980s for crop diversification. Back then, our biggest crop was wheat. Our second biggest crop was summer fallow. Uh, was not growing a crop for a year. And it was a predominantly a wheat fallow rotation. And that resulted in the formation of a, a crop development center with plant breeders to breed different crops. And they were very successful. That, that, that's what got us going down the pulses, down uh, in, in Got us going more in the oat and canola, of course, came along as well, but that's not grown organically, right? Because all canola is herbicide tolerant or GM or close to it, and it's uh, you just can't grow it organically in Western Canada. One of the crops I deal with, and you guys probably haven't heard heard with, and I'm trying to think, how do I get this uh, video to start playing now? Let me have to turn the. Sorry about this uh, technical difficulty. I should have come up here and. Hmm, I've got a few videos, but I can't seem to get them playing. Um, oops. Is there any, any techies around there? Oh, here, I should be able to get a play now. Okay, great. So this is lentils growing this with a stop motion camera. And what, the first thing you'll know is they're small. And you may think that's just because it's early in the season. Well, that's true but they're not gonna get much bigger. They don't grow very tall. They grow about maybe, at the most they would grow maybe, there, that's full height, full canopy height, probably about 14 inches, 16 inches, maybe a foot and a half on a really good year. Uh, and here you can see there's plant disease setting in and uh, we didn't, uh, and uh, they're dying up. There's different varieties. There's some of them more disease susceptible than others and that, but even the ones that weren't disease susceptible are ripening up now. So it's a very short crop and not very competitive at all. This is the one that I chose to really start my work. And I remember this is the only time I've ever had a government agency come to me and say, we would like to give you money to work on a project. And I said, great, that's, that's super good. You know, I couldn't believe it. The, the gods have smiled upon me. And then they said, we want you to do organic weed control and lentil. And I went, bah! <laughs> you know, like what? Are you insane? Like there's no way, there's no way you can grow that crop organically. I'd have to be stupid to try. 
well, of course, you know, I'm not going to turn down the money. So uh, we did look at it. So we looked at it and here's, here's lentil growing. One of the first things it did, this wasn't the first thing we did, but I like to show it just because it kind of outlines kind of a basic uh, ecological principle is we did a project, uh, great student Leah Fedorak, and we worked out the critical period of weed control in lentil. And it turns out it kind of from about the five node stage to the nine node stage, just when it starts to flower, is when you have to keep it weed free. And that kind of gave us a, you, of course you can you keep it weed free earlier, but this is when you absolutely have to kill the weeds by to prevent yield loss. So, and you can see this is wild oats growing in a, in a, in a plot beside it that's not controlled. And this is, these are lentils that, and so you can see the potential for weed competition in this crop. If the weeds overtop it, you're done. Basically it's you're finished. There's, you know, you can't, there's no going back, you know, competition's a, is a very, is more than a one-sided game with plants, right? Because it's not fair, because if a plant gets taller than your crop, if a weed gets taller than your crop, it's not based on size anymore. It's that, that because that plant's above, above the, the crop, it's harvesting the light, it's intercepting the light before it can get to the one below it. So it's kind of the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer in, the, in that kind of state of uh, the crops. So one of the, another thing I, I looked at early on is to look at crop variety selection. And I'll, I'll just jump back to field pea here for a second because this is a project that we're, there's a lot of dry pea production too and this was part of the same project. We looked at uh, lentil and pea. I added pea to the project because I thought, well, I know that I could probably devise a system to grow um, to, for weed control and pea that would be there and I, I wasn't sure if I could do one for lentil. But we grew leafed and semi-leafless peas uh, leaf, uh, leafed and semi-leafless peas. I thought I had a different slide in here, but I guess it didn't save. But any, anyway, so there's two types of leaf patterns. The modern varieties of peas have, are semi-leafless, where they just have, ten, oh, you guys can't see that one. Sorry, I have to put the laser back on again. Boy, oh boy. Should have had another cup of coffee, shirt love. <laughs> Okay, so you can see the tendrils there. So there's di big differences in these varieties in, the, in how they were. So we looked at those. What we found is that there was this one variety, 4010, which was just a monster at biomass accumulation. And it didn't even matter if it was growing or there was weeds. It had, and this is over multiple years. I think this is over four site years of data. It, it was just a absolute competitive monster. And how, why it was that way is because it would kind of grow up and then it would lodge badly and fall over and kind of crush the weeds like a WrestleMania wrestler or something like that. I'm just saying that because I saw that on the hotel TV last night when I was zipping around. But anyways. Uh, and, uh, and it also allowed a lot, hardly any weed production, any weed production over time. And so that gave us an idea. We thought, okay, that's great. What if we, but the trouble, but the trouble was, as I said, is this, is this variety lodged very badly and uh, it wasn't suitable for seed production really at all because you know, it, you know, to harvest it was almost impossible and everything. So we did a large project. I'm not going to show you the details of it uh, and a spoiler alert because it didn't work because we worked with a plant breeder. We uh, well, we actually looked at some one project where we compared leafed and semi leafless varieties. But of course, when you're comparing different varieties that differ for one trait, they also differ in a bunch of other stuff, too. So it's not a real fair comparison. Right. So we actually worked with a plant breeder who actually bred the the same varieties with the leafed gene and the semi leafless gene in it and then compared them and we got some early tantalizing results but when we start to look into them there was no difference and we had a, a great gra uh, yeah, here's the different leaf types this leafed and semi leafless we thought the leafed would be the leaf are more competitive but they don't stand as well because with the tendrils the peas can grab onto each other and stand and uh, and and not and not fall down we had a great grand, uh, grad student, Yan Ben Shen. He's now doing a PhD at Iowa State down here in the Midwest. And uh, basically all he found in his entire master's was that the proportion of leafed and semi-leafless affected the lodging. It didn't affect their yield or their kind of competitiveness or anything like that, which was unfortunate. But, um, you know, because we thought it might be, might be something there. And that maybe brings me to kind of the first, and I'm not going to talk about any other negative results in this talk because I've, and I've had a lot over the years. I tell you, we've looked at almost anything you can think of, every organic herbicide that's out there and all sorts of strange stuff. And um, 
we, and we've had some stuff that's worked. I'm not talking about plant nutrients here, but I was talking about, we were talking about crystal green struvite earlier. I just had a student that finished with that. That works great. It's not certified organic in Canada. I wish it was because it would be a good way for farmers to deal with the phosphorus deficiency that they have up there. But anyways, I'm back talking about weeds here. So the one thing, the principle of uh, crop variety selection is to select a more competitive variety if it's available and known. The reality is, is we don't usually know what varieties are more competitive, and sometimes we're fooled. I know Dilshan, in his masters, he looked at oats, and we assumed that the semi-dwarf variety, the high-yielding semi-dwarf variety, would be the least competitive with weeds. It wasn't. It was pretty darn good. And you know what? It also yielded really high as well. It also had high yield production, even under organic conditions. So that wasn't there. You know, in some cases, there are differences, but in a lot of cases are not. The different, and the diff those differences between most varieties are not very consistent, you know, between locations and years. Yes, you may get one year that doesn't, and not others, but I think we have to look at, you know, I'm not trying to rain on anybody's parade if there's any plant breeders out there, but plant breeding is a really expensive long-term activity, and the chances of getting a variety registered are very low in most cases. So organic-specific varieties, I know, and I'm basing this on work that I've seen in the prairies, it just hasn't panned out. We've had some organic specific varieties and some work in this, and it's always turned out that the modern, the modern uh, varieties that bred under conventional conditions work just as well or better. So I'm not, yeah, so I hope I, I, hope I haven't hurt anybody there, but that's my humble opinion. Uh, but anyways, okay, let's move on. This next one is we're getting into kind of the meat of what we're talking about. Here's a, here's a, just a, a, an organic trial we had. And it was very interesting because it was a very simple trial. There's with no crop growing. And you can see these, because there's wild mustard growing, that's one, that's one of the main weeds under organic crop production in Western Canada, wild mustard. It's, it's, um, it was under conventional, on conventional production. It was a big weed until herbicides came in in the 50s. But you can see that that here we're obviously having something that's, that's, that's almost eliminating the wild mustard. And in this, in, this, in this case, all this was was crop seeding rate. It's just seeding your crop heavier. And I'm, I'm building upon the, upon the uh, you know, I'm standing on the backs of giants when doing research like this, you know, people like Chuck Moeller and Eric Gallant, and, you know, that really pushed this idea of increasing the crop seeding rate for years and, uh, and um, yeah, and I think it's something there. But let's get back to lentils where we talked about. Here we have, uh, this is the first study I did when we started growing lentils. And I've showed you what a, you know, and I, no offense to lentils, but I, and I, I sometimes call them a crappy little plant because they are a crappy little plant. They're just so little that well, we grew these. And so when we looked at them, this is our recommended seeding rate that existed there. And this was grown on organic, farms, re like we went out to organic farmers, real organic farmers, real organic land, real organic weeds that were growing out there. And so we grew them, and this is our seeding rate that recommended when we got to kind of, and you can see this is the plant biomass. As we increased our seeding rate, we're increasing our plant biomass, and we're decreasing our weed biomass. Well, what's happening? Well, nothing fancy. It's just that it's just a numbers. It's a proportions game. The higher proportion of crop plants are there, the higher proportion of space they'll take. Will they ever get all of it? No, because it's a proportional game, right? And you can never get, you can never get to 100% control with something like that, because you're still gonna have some of the other, some of the space occupied by the weeds. But we went from, uh, you know, here of, uh, at the recommended seeding rate of almost having equal amount of weed and crop biomass on average to, you know, being able to increase our seeding rate. In this case, we went to like three times the recommended. We were able to, you know, reduce our, reduce our weed biomass by a huge amount. And we did the economics on this and it all penciled out fine. And so that, and you know, here's our seed yield. We, were, we got higher seed, we got, we got more seed yield return. And that was, you know, for lentils, that's quite a respectable yield, getting over a thousand pounds an acre, especially under organic conditions. And the recommended there. Here's where the plots looked like under the, uh, uh, under like those high, higher seeding rates. You know, we were still getting, of course, some weed escapes going, coming through there. And here you can see, somebody was asking me about wild oats earlier. Here's some wild oats growing in there as well and some thistles in the background. Of course, you know, a lot of these uh, changing the seeding rate, it's not gonna have as much effect on perennial weeds, but we'll get into perennial weeds near the end. So field P, we did the same thing, similar, similar type of curve. Uh, wheat, 
similar curve, increases seeding rate, increases seeding rate, you get more, and this is grown under organic conditions, you get more crop and you get less thing. Oh, these seeding rates are in seeds per meter squared. If you want to change it into a, uh, something you understand, just divide it by 10 and that'll be plants per square foot. So, uh, you know, this would be, you know, so this would be going up to 50 plants per square foot approximately. So that, you know, if that, and then if you want to divide, get into plants per acre, seeds per acre, divide it times it by 43,560. I remember doing that when I was, used to be on the farm, I'd be up there with a the calculator, you know, trying to figure out how long it's gonna take us to finish, finish, finish combine in the field or something, right? Okay, we're cutting about 28 feet long, or I'm going three and a half miles an hour, and then, okay, how many feet is that? And then divide by 43, yeah, you know, anyways, doing all that crazy math. <laughs> That's what we used to do in the old days. But anyway, so, so uh, and of course, wheat, we found it kind of, uh, this is a really dry year, so our yield wasn't particularly high, but one ton an acre, that's only about 22 bushels an acre. Uh, 22 bushels an acre, and uh, that thing. So anyways, crop seeding rate. So the principle is increasing the seeding rate to aid in both the competition and in the, uh, to aid in the competition to both suppress the weeds and increase the yield. That's the two sides of competition, is you're always trying to deal with both of them. One is like is, is holding down the weeds and the other is utilizing those resources to increase the yield of your crop, right? So this is the most effective way to increase both the crop yield and reduce the weed growth when available. And you know, I'm basing this on Chuck Moeller's recommendations for crops that we don't know anything about, that, um, that the seeding rate from most, most crops under organic conditions should be at least one and a half times what the recommendation is. One of the reasons we were able to get kind of reasonable or pretty good lentil yields under those conditions was that we also employed techniques that organic farmers were using. We, you know, we used a, uh, we used a rotary, oh, sorry, we used a tine harrow. We used a tine harrow on our plots for those lentil plots because otherwise we wouldn't have, it would have the weeds without any in-crop mechanical weed control, it would have been um, impossible to impossible to do it. And here, here's just some work. I just want to introduce this with, and again, introduce an old colleague of mine, uh, Eric Johnson, who's done a, who in many ways paved the way for most of this research in Western Canada. I'll bring up his name again and again. Here, he just looked at kind of field peel yield as a relative control, and he kind of determined that if you got about between about 40, about 60% about crop burial, you know, try not to bury too much of your crop, that that tended to get the highest yield, using that as trying to figure out a rule of thumb for farmers on how much, on how, you know, and, you know there's always that question when you're harrowing weeds, you know, when you're harrowing crop, when you're doing weed control of the harrow is how intense should it be, right? And, you know, and uh, that old adage of, you know, don't look back and it, it, don't worry, it'll recover is not necessarily true. You can kill your crop with weeding, right, with harrows. And you've got people, I've seen some smiles out there. People have done it, right? And it's like, oh, yeah, that was too intense. What's nice is we're seeing machinery that's a lot more easily adjustable. And I think the tines have a lot more wider adjustable ability range, so you can dial them in a lot more, much like people would dial in their espresso shot in the morning. They can dial in their weed control. So anyway, so one thing we did with this is we, when we got further along here, is we decided to, we decided to combine these tactics. You know, there was a lot of work at that time about, uh, about achieving um, synergistic effects in weed control and hopefully we're, you know, where you could, this plus, you know, one plus one plus one is equal to five, you know, or eight, you know, which never really made sense to me, but, uh, but we, so we decided to look at a large trial where we looked at competitive and non-competitive variety. This is an oat. I know there's a lot of interest about oat here, so I made sure these slides are in. Uh, low and high seeding rates, normal and 2x. We threw row width in there, like how wide the cedar is, and then harrowing, in-crop harrowing and none. We'd already done some work in oat, because the old, and some of you may have run across recommendations like this. If you search oat and mechanical weed control on the no oil Google out there, you'll, you'll run across some extension publications from back in 1947 or something like that, 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 that tell you that you can't, that you can't use mechanical weed control, heroin in oat. That is not true. Uh, we've proven that conclusively and we've done heaps of mechanical weed control and also you can use tine harrows in oat, but there are, that information is still out there in the web. I think it is at least, you know, but it wasn't certainly at this time, maybe it's changing out there. It's hard to get rid of that stuff 
if it's already out there. But anyway, so that's what we looked at. Here's kind of our base level treatment. Our oats growing in, uh, so that's, that's 25 plants per meter squared. That would be about probably two bushels per acre of oats because uh, oats have that, we had that discussion about a crazy light bushel they are and how it varies. There's a 32 bushel, 32 pound bushel here in Canada is a 34 pound bushel, but oats usually weigh up at least 40 pounds per bushel if they've had reasonable uh, growing conditions. So it's kind of a crazy, just think of it in pounds per acre. That's what I always told people. It's like when you're dialing in oat seeding rate, do it in pounds per acre. So this is the regular seeding rate, about 25 plants per square foot. Double that at 50 plants per square foot, and you can see there's more plants there. This is when we had the narrow rows, uh, narrow rows and added in harrowing, and this is the kind of the base wider rows with unharrowed. And what were our results? So our first is our crop density effect. What we found is that we increased it, we got our, our predictable uh, yield boost, we got a yield boost by doubling our seeding rate, uh, you know, from about two to four bushels per acre. Heroin double, uh, increased our yield on average about 13%. Uh, Heroin gave uh, a good control of our weeds wherever the weeds came up. Then one year, 2008, was one of those glorious years, and you guys may have had them, you know, where you actually plant your crop under organic conditions and weeds don't come up. It's dry right after, right? You've killed them all and you, do, and you get your crop and it's like, yes, why can't it be this way every year? And uh, so heroin made no difference in a year that, it was, and, and a, a regular farmer wouldn't have harrowed, but as part of the protocol, right? It's like, why would you have harrowed? But, but we had reasonable, we could reduce our densities by a fair bit by doing it. And here you can see kind of the wild mustard makes for very photogenic uh, weed control pictures because you can see the yellow blossoms in the plots that have been harrowed and ones that haven't, you know, so you can see them quite well. We did have a genotype effect in here, even though I've just told you it didn't, but we had, this was growing a forage type oat which had really wide leaves, really wide leaves, and uh, it isn't really suitable for, no, no, no grain buyers were, were interested in buying it, but this Ronald was the standard variety at the time for oats, so we had a, we reduced our weed biomass by growing the forage oat instead of the seed oat. And our weed biomass reduction from doubling our seeding rate was quite high. We reduced our weed biomass by half, more than we even expected. But was, so when we put this all together, heroin and high crop density increased our grain yield by 25%, more than offset the cost of the seed, uh, weed biomass, the competitive cultivar and high cropping nets. The real one, we put everything together, we didn't get a synergistic effect. We weren't getting uh, anything more than we would have expected by just adding them together. There was an additive effect, but we still got, we got, we got the equivalent of 71% reduction in weed biomass. And we were really happy because we were, our control in this was already good crop agronomy. We didn't prejudice by doing nothing. We, we you know, we grew, we, well, we didn't have mechanical weed control, but we grew it with good crop agronomy. So uh, we were very pleased. You know, we thought this was nearing the level of herbicidal weed control. And uh, yeah, so that was great. Right around this time, my friend Eric Johnson, he had been down, I don't know where he got this idea, but he had seen what a mintil rotary hoe was. And he brought one up to, uh, to Scott Saskatchewan where he was working. And the first time I saw one is I laughed at it. I thought, that isn't gonna control weeds. What did you do, what did you waste your money on that for? I thought like, we mean those tines turning around are gonna control weeds? No way, no way. And I was so wrong, I was so wrong. I'm happy to say that uh, I was so wrong because I'm gonna, I'm a big fan of rotary hose. Uh, in fact, I made, I don't, I don't show it up here, but I made a video online uh, of that, yeah, that you know, that uh, kind of a, kind of act like a used car salesman, camp it up a bit, but it's been seen a lot. And but I also noticed when I was checking tonight, uh, when I was checking last night, that there is a the Iowa Practical Farmers have a great video about uh, rotary hoe that was up there, and it's great to see what farmers talking about. Because you know, one thing that I realized, and this conference has realized, it's great to talk, it's great for you guys to listen to research. But what you really want to do is you want to talk to other farmers and to see, okay, what have they done that the research have maybe suggested, and what really works on your farm, right? That's kind of a, that, that's, what, that's what farmers really want to see. Yeah, but anyway, so but you get me.
anyways. <laughs> so anyway, so the first thing that Eric, Eric looked at this and he found that it worked well in crop residue. In fact, it could go through crop residue. That was one of the issues that we have with harrows is that a lot of our crops produce residue. We, even organic farmers don't practice uh, inversion tillage because of the, how dry it is in Saskatchewan. I didn't say how dry it was, but we're only, you know, we, we get between 30 and 50, or well, let's try, we get between, we get between 12 inches and, uh, and 18 inches of total precipitation on, a, on average for a year. And we haven't had an average year in 10 years. We've been below average for that. So it's not uncommon for us to get less than, some of those areas to get less than, like to get 10 inches precip for the entire year, including snowfall. So, it's, uh, we, so it, it is challenging from an erosion point of view, but, but uh, having that. Uh, we, Eric found out that uh, the, all the lentils, peas, and chickpeas were all quite tolerant to rotary hoe, not surprisingly. And uh, around that time as well, we also started to look at inter-row cultivation. And we bought ourselves a Smotzer, which was not a, not a camera-driven system, but it has a steering wheel up here. You can just see the edge of it a steering wheel that uh, to steer them back and forth. So we rely on a, instead of a machine learning uh, algorithm, we rely on a, on a bio, on a bio, on a bio, uh, biological detector and actuator, which is a graduate student steering the wheel. Yeah, anyways, Catherine Stanley, uh, another great grad student that came through the program, uh, did some work on looking at in field pee at this point, we moved on to field pea uh, and looking at the inter-row inter -row cultivation tolerance of it. We also looked at lentil as well. Uh, so, uh, so we found that there was, that the inter-row cultivation did, if you did cultivate it late, as you cultivated it later, it did affect the yield, but during the critical period of weed control for pea, it, especially if you got it on the early side, it wasn't ha adversely affecting the, the, um, the yield potential. Then came along this great, this great student, Alex Alba. Alex Alba came over from the Ukraine, uh, um, and uh, and he came from a family from a ag engineering kind of background. So he loved working with machinery. Uh, you know, his, da uh, his dad was a machinery dealer in uh, in the Ukraine, and uh, he wanted to. And and so we gave him this the, the best project that we could have for him. We gave him this project that was comparing mechanical weed control. Because what was happening around that time is I was on the, I'd been around a lot to all the organic conferences in Western Canada from uh, the, the Peace River Valley, you know, 100, 100 miles south of the Northwest Territories all the way to Manitoba. I'd, been in every, and, I, and I'd talk about, I'd talk about, you know, weed control. I'd say, oh yeah, you know, rotary hoes work good, you know, uh, inter-row cultivators work good, uh, tying harrows work good, and I'd always get people come up to me after, which one works best? Which one should I buy? Which one should I buy? That was always the question I'd get. So I thought, well, okay, let's do a head-to-head -head trial comparing them, you know, and so that's what we did with this trial is we looked at the rotary hoe, which as you know, is uh, rotary hoes, you know, like control weeds, small seeded weeds that shallowly emerge very early, right? That's, that's ro the rotary hoe. If it was a superhero, that would be its superpower. White thread stage, I kill, you know. Harrows, and it's got excellent, excellent crop tolerance at almost any stage, you know. It's, it's hard to hurt a crop with a rotary hoe. You can some, but it's, it's, it's we found in small grains it's difficult. Harrows are a bit, are a bit, uh, tying harrows are a bit different. The crop's fair to good tolerance. You can hurt the crop. And in fact, you know, just after, when it's emerging or just after, the crop is sensitive as well. So you gotta kind of wait for the crop to get up. And if your weeds have gotten big in that time, it can be difficult, but they can still work well, but it, crows, it controls pre-emergence to small seedlings. And then inter-row cultivation, well that you have to wait a while because you have to be able to see the rows, although with the new technology that's out there, uh, that you know, it, it, it's, it's, changed, it's changed a lot. So, uh, but uh, when, when, you know, that you have to, but typically the camera or per people guided systems, it relies on you seeing the rows. So it has to be later and, uh, and the tolerance we weren't, yeah, the tolerance tends to be pretty good unless you over cultivate. And here's maybe we'll show some, oh, I'm gonna, I gotta make sure that the sound's off on these so that we don't um, turn this off. Or no, how did I do that? So here's the, these are the hair, a harrow going in field P. 
uh, Alex, uh, yeah, he, he, you know, he bought a GoPro out of his own funds and started mounting it on all the machinery he did to make some of these great videos. And you can see the, some of the weeds that have been pulled out there on the tines. You can also see that it's pulling out some of the peas as well, right? It turns out harrows actually work, the Europeans have done some work, and harrows actually work much of their weed controls by covering the weeds. Here's a rotary hoe. Of course, rotary hoes, you can't see that. It's hard to see how much it is. It controls weeds in the small stage. And then that's, of course, just a small plot version. They come much larger. You guys know this. You've seen this is where rotary hose come. And interrow tillage here. And you can see our interrow tillage going. Uh, I'm not cool. Oh, lamb's quarters be gone. Red root pigweed be gone. You know, uh, and uh, there's some buckwheat, right? These are probably weeds. You, do you guys have these weeds? Yeah. And then, of course, you know, the, the nice thing about interro harrowing is it makes interro cultivation it makes you feel really good, right? Because you get all this nice black earth between the row and everything, right? That's the nice thing. So, in terms of uh, in terms of looking at rotary hoeing, of course, again, the small weeds in the white thread stage after you kind of flick them out, so you got these weeds on the surface. Harrowing, you know, you're doing it later in the season, and ho hopefully getting some control like this interro. Interrow inter tillage, you know, narrow row cultivation. You do it obviously later when you can see the rows and then, uh, and then getting them there. So what did we find out? Well, visually, it came out very early. We were getting, and we weren't really surprised by this, but the rotary hoe was giving us really nice weed control. Our crew had kind of dialed it in by now. Timing is everything with, rotary, with, ro with the rotary hoe, right? You have a window of a day or two to get those weeds in the right stage. And if it, gets, if it rains during that time, you're hooped. You know, you can't, you can't get them because, the, because you need that soil to be in a loose, dry method as well. So it works well, but it also, but it also have to rate conditions. And you also can't have too many rocks as well. If, you, if you're in really rocky areas, you're going to break them up a lot. So that may be where it comes in where, where that. Uh, we also have, here we have untreated versus rotary hoe and interro tillage. And you can see, you know, you don't need to do statistics on that to figure out that we're getting some, re some pretty good weed control. We did, however, find that when we added all three together that, we were getting, that our crop tolerance was improving. We were just beating our crop back too much and the crop canopy was suffering and weeds were coming through those holes in the canopy as a result. We did this over four years, uh, two different locations for two years, so we're quite confident in our results. Our weed biomass, our seeding rate, going to a higher seeding rate. Uh, in this case, we were using, uh, I think, double the normal rate for lentil, uh, or two and a half times the normal rate for lentil. We reduced weed biomass by 16%. In terms of our mechanical weed control, this is our untreated, where we didn't do any mechanical weed control, and this is averaged over both seeding rates. Uh, and here's a, ro a rotary hoe. This is the weed biomass, harrowing, and intercrop tillage. When you started to put them together, rotary hoe and harrow, rotary hoe, intercrop tillage, they started to get really nice when you had rotary hoe, when you started to add interrow tillage in with some of the, in with either rotary hoeing or harrowing. Being able to come back and clean up those ones between the row, and this HW is hand weeded here. So that gave us our best effect, a 76 decrease in weed biomass. And this is annual weed biomass. We're not talking about perennial weeds. Nope, these don't work. Where's the darn? They may affect it a little bit. In terms of yield, we got a 30% yield boost. Again, this is in kilograms per hectare, but you can think of those in pounds per acre. So we're growing about you know, 1,300 pounds per acre of lentils. You can make good money on that, right? I'm not sure what organic lentils are worth right now. Uh, you, you know, to grow lentils down here, unfortunately, lentils are, there's an old expression about lentils. Lentils need rain twice. They need it after you seed, and they need it when you cook them. So, uh, <laughs> they won't grow in a drought, but they are one of the more drought tolerant crops. Uh, they won't, they won't grow without water, but they are one of the ones that their yield doesn't go down as much. Um, so anyway, anyway, so that's, that's where we, that's where we looked at there. So we thought this was a nice, uh, and then oh, when we look at the yield boost from doing that again, rotary hoe into row tillage was kind of the, kind of the, our king, but that implies that you can get on the field and use a rotary hoe at the time that it happens to be, and if you, if you get rained in that period, you're going to realistically have to come back, 
you know, a few days later when it dries up, hopefully, and use a harrow instead. So it kind of comes down, what do you need? What does an organic farmer need for small grains? I would say they probably, you know, realistically, if they can afford it, is all three. But if you had to pick one, I would just buy the road. Well, maybe the, you know, the harrow, you could argue, even though it's not as good as the, is not as good as the rotary hoe, it has some versatility in that you can use it later. So again, I, again, I'm a typical academic. I provide no firm answers, right? <laughs> Uh, we've also done, we've also uh, revisited organically grown oats. This, we had done that project with Dilshan. What we really wanted to do, and I won't present the crop nutrient information here, is that we wanted to, is that we wanted to um, look at, how, at pushing the yield in organic oat. Dilshan's, the yields he was getting weren't that great, so we combined, in this project, I won't show you the plant nutrient stuff, but we combined it with, we looked at uh, adding in pelletized chicken manure and, and other sources of manure for, to increase the yield. And unfortunately, for a couple years of it, that we, the, the experiment is that uh, we got into some, a drought cycle and our yield potentials went really down. But we did manage to grow, we did manage to grow, uh, in the first year of this, we managed to grow 150 bushel per acre organic oat, which was, we're really proud of. That, that was, you know, in that 34 pound bushels. Uh, that, uh, yeah, that was, I remember, and it's kind of one of those things of the first year, and then we got started to get dry periods after that. But again, if we look at here, we looked at, we hadn't looked at rotary hoe in uh, oat before, but here's our, here's our, um, our, our uh, Here's our, um, our, our yield and our, and, our weed, and, our, and our weed biomass. You can see with rotary hoeing, we'd gotten quite good with that. We could reduce our weed biomass by a heck of a lot. Here's with inter-row cultivation alone. Still doing a reasonable job compared to the control and adding them together. In this case, it didn't make a huge difference in that one site, but in the other site, adding them together. And this is at high and low seeding rates. At, at regular seeding rate, about two, two bushels per acre and about higher seeding rated at four bushels per acre. And that interesting, in the drier years, we didn't get a positive, as much of a positive yield response to our increased seeding rate because uh, it was just so dry that we weren't getting the, the yield. You can see we're getting about 2,500 pounds an acre or close to 3,000 3, pounds per acre of uh, oats, which would be, that's still about 80 bushels an acre of oats. We weren't really that happy with it because uh, we, we wanted to get higher, but, that, but that, those are the yields that we were getting. Well, we got that at the one place, 80, and we would have got about 60 bushels per acre at another one. And we're getting a slight boost from the, from the, uh, from the weed control measures in the one in here, the rotary hoe and intro cultivation. One at the one and the other one, just a, just a rotary hoe was good enough. So that, so that you know, as you see, there's, there's, there's getting a common theme here, rotary hoe, rotary hoe, rotary hoe. Yeah, they've worked well for us, you know, uh, thing. Organically grown flax. Uh, I know I noticed there was a buyer buying flax here. I heard a few people talking about flax out there. We've done a fair bit of work in that. Flax is a lot like lentils. It's a, a crappy little crop. <laughs> I don't mean that anything about the plant, oh, the thing, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's just a little plant, right? It only grows this tall. It's hard to grow organically. There's been a fair, there's been a lot of work. A former graduate student of mine, Lana Shaw, kind of started up, uh, kind of started looking at flax chickpea intercropping. Uh, uh, under conventional conditions mostly. And I think that may have a good fit under organic, although, you know, like uh, chickpeas don't like water. Saskatchewan's actually pretty much too wet for chickpeas in most years. So chickpeas grow best in Western Montana and, uh, and places like that where it's really, really, really dry, not just a little bit dry. But anyways, I think growing them with flax, you can, uh, you can push them into the moist areas and certainly we have, we've grown them in Saskatoon, which is more moist compared to the Southern part of the province. But if this is just growing straight organic flax, poor competitor with, with weeds, short seed, uh, small seed, seeded crop, short stature small seeds. Uh, this, is a, this is again showing the power of increasing the seeding rate. This is a, a, about 100, this is like how many uh, seed plants per meter square, targeted plants per meter square. If you divide that by, if you divide that by, so that'd be similar to, if you divide that by 10, you get seeds per meter per, per foot squared. So at 100 seeds per foot square, if you're targeting 100 plants per foot squared, you're get, you can see as you increase your seeding rate, we're reducing our weed biomass. Here, and this was averaged over two years, this project. 
adding in our mechanical weed control. You can see that our control going down to inter-row cultivation, going down to uh, rotary hoe, and then rotary hoe plus inter-row cultivation, we reduced our weed mass, our re weed biomass the most. And we were surprised in this one. We didn't think that you'd be able to rotary hoe flax. And we did have to be careful that we weren't, because uh, flax is a small seeded crop, we thought we'd be flicking the seeds out of the ground and the seedlings, but these are the results we got. Uh, it, you, know, you did have to be careful with it. You know, if you were doing too much, you obviously couldn't do it, because you can't harrow flax. That's one of the things, because it's such a small seeded crop that you'll, uh, pull them out or cover them up. So the rotary hoe was a nice, a nice fit into that. Here's the yield responses here, and you can see, you just think of those in pounds per acre for, fla for flax. You know, where we're getting close to 1,000, 800, 1,000 pounds per acre, you know, which, you know, at, which at, you know, 40 cents a pound, 40, 40 to 50 cents a pound, that's $400 gross an acre uh, for, organic, for organic flax. Uh, in crop weed seed management, I'm going to finish off talking about that. Uh, and this is, uh, and the idea with in seed weed uh, production uh, is in crop weed seed management is to re is reduce the production of viable weed seed. You're not doing anything for this year's crop; it's for the future. Um, you know, there's several ways: mowing, weed clipping. Uh, we have tried mowing. I remember some farmer. There's a lot, there's so many trials. That, uh, in fact, I was talking about putting together a presentation of all the things that I've done in my career that haven't worked. You know, because we don't publish them, and this is basically to stop people in the future from trying to do them, right? Because they don't work, and then you don't tell anybody, right? And then, uh, and uh, you know, we did. I remember some somebody had an idea, and that some people had tried it of going out and just mowing barley down. And they say, well, barley will come back, and the weeds don't come back as quickly. Well, we tried that for two or three years in a row didn't work. The weeds came back quicker than the barley and the yield was reduced like heck, just mowing, like in crop mowing, like, like, not, like not between rows. I think now with some of these new mowers that go between the rows, that's some really cool technology that I think there's some, you know, yeah, some of the younger people are gonna be working with in this area. But you know, we had, you know, we had dumb tools to work with. You know, we, were, we weren't working with, you know, we weren't working with, uh, you know, intelligent, smart uh, equipment. We were working with just dumb equipment, you know. Not to say there's anything bad with it, but it wasn't self-steering or, or didn't have any lasers or guys or go around weeds. I think now that we have that, we can finally get into some really non, some really uh, selective weed control in organic. But anyways, but anyways, in terms of getting back to in-crop weed seed management, mowing and clipping and harvest weed seed management, which I don't think I'll have time to talk about, but I did some work in my PhD way back in the mid nineties. Uh, most weed seeds, the idea of in-crop weed seed management, especially the clipping stuff is that most weed seeds are, or the idea is that if, when we look out there, we see a lot of weed seeds that are produced above the crop canopy. Here's some wild oats above, above a wheat field. Here's some thistles that are growing up there. Here's some wild mustard that's growing up above something. Idea, can you, can you just cut them off there? And is that gonna, is that gonna stop the weed seeds from going in? And we've done, I don't, I'm, not, I, I'm not even showing the work we did in, in Wild Oat with uh, Brianne Tideman, but the results were fairly mixed. We, there wasn't a lot of the weed seeds up there. You kind of remember the, the, the plants that, uh, that are like this, but in fact, there's a whole bunch that are kind of hunkered down. They're producing a lot of seeds at the same height as the canopy. Well, we'll talk about, a little bit about that. But we looked at a few, a few projects with this. Uh, and a lot, and, because, and, as, and as it always gets, this research was, was, uh, was uh, inspired by my old friend, Eric Johnson. Oh, there's his name up there. I wanted to highlight his name where he did just by hand, did a project way back in, I think the nineties, looking at clipping wild oat and by hand, and he found that he could get good results in a late clip. And he found that the, it, that the amount of seeds that, that grew the next year were similar to a herbicide treatment. That if you headed weedy and let the seeds fall down, this is how many weeds grew the next year. If you clipped them off, this is how many weeds grew the next year, about half. And herb, it was about the same as herbicide, because of course they're coming from the seed bank as well. Of course there are commercial uh, machines available out there, and I remember, I think about 2000 and, uh, 2013 maybe, I went to a European weed, uh, weed conference and I went, it was in Sweden, and I went and saw this crazy machine called a comb cut that had, uh, that had these, um, 
that had these exacto blade knives mounted blades now and then the knife stayed still you'll see some video of it later but this reel spins around at a fast speed and pushes the weeds into it and the idea is with these was that you can adjust the angle of this is that is that the is that erect leaves like a wheat leaf can slide through them but you know your stiff leaves like a mustard or a broadleaf plant that have a stiff stem will be cut so that that was the idea there and there was also in our in my home province of Saskatchewan there was a company a short line company that that actually introduced a weed clipper um, you know 50 feet wide that works on a different principle essentially a bunch of rotary mowers that uh, that can clip that can clip uh, weeds there we ended up we ended up uh, testing the we ended up buying one of the comb cuts having it shipped over from Sweden and looked at it in lentil to deal with what are the problems that we're going to have when we do have those weedy escape. You know, those, 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 you don't always get 100% weed control and you have those weeds that overtop the lentils. The lentils are only this tall. You get weeds that are overtop them. How does it control them? When we looked at that, we found that if we did it kind of weekly or if we did it weekly or every, essentially when the weeds grew up to a reasonable height, we could reduce the wild mustard seed production down to a very low level compared to the check. We could uh, essentially, because the, all of the seed pods were happening above the lentils. And, uh, and here's the lentil yield. However, the lentil yield was not affected by it. Even our best treatments for weed control, these two here, the lentil yield was still much lower than the weedy check. In this case, about 2,500 pounds. This is grown under conventional conditions just because we wanted to control the weeds that were growing there. We want to be able to have just one species to keep it more scientific. Uh, clipping regrowth, let's, uh, I should be getting better at this by now. Let's click this video. Here is this machine working. You can see how it kind of works. It kind of clips them as it goes through. So you have to go out there and you have to use it more than once. Probably you could get away with twice, but if you let them grow too big, like in this one here, you can see the wild mustard's already potted out. It's just the stems are just too, too thick, and it just plugged it up. We could have gone a bit slower, I suppose, but it still waited too long to do that. So that, so that, you know, we were pleased with that in lentil. Here was a way that you could control weed seed production for those escapes. And we thought, well, this is, could be good for organic farmers, could be good for conventional farmers too. They were having huge issues with herbicide resistant wild mustard and, uh, and, wild, and herbicide resistant kochia at that time. The, the, the take up in the, in the conventional market was Zippo. Uh, nothing, <laughs> interestingly enough. We did try it in cereals. We had a project to look at it in wheat with Brian Tideman of Al uh, Alberta. And he, well, here's again showing the blades here, showing the blades. And uh, what we found is we weren't able to replicate the results that the Europeans have. We we're working with spring crops and the phenological differences in, in height between our crops and our, between wheat and our weeds, we never got a situation like we had in lentils where we had the crops down here and the weeds up here and we could just cut the weeds off. It was always where we're trying to go into the canopy to cut the weeds and when we were doing that, no matter how we adjusted the, these tines, we were still getting significant damage of our crop. And so at best we could reduce our weed seed production by about uh, you know by about half compared to not doing it which but when we were doing that we were cutting our we were cutting we were cutting the meristems off of our cereals and making a heck of a mess and reducing the yield so we it just didn't work out in that one there our final one that we want to look at was to look at it in Canada the thistle. Could this be a long-term solution to Canada the thistle? Could we use it in that? So we had a piece of land, of organic land, that we hadn't done a good job of managing, and it had gotten infested with Canada thistle. Uh, quite bad. The farm manager was very, uh, <laughs> wasn't appreciative of it. And, uh, but we thought, hey, when it rains lemons, let's make lemonade. Let's do a project on Canada thistle. So what we did is did that. And so we 
put together this long-term project. And this is again another one that, so that I haven't presented this work ever because the project just ended uh, two years ago. And then during COVID, there was no extension events at all. Uh, so we were looking at optimizing green manure crops for Canada thistle control. And Canada thistle is not from Canada, so don't blame me, okay? <laughs> so there. Uh, yeah, so we use it as a four-year experiment. And here you can see the clipper in, in Canada thistle is visually very impressive, right? Here is like a, a big patch of Canada thistle, and we've clipped this side, and we, haven't, and we haven't clipped this side, and I think, yes, I'm hammering it to that thistle. It's, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, it's very satisfying to do these, you know, the thistle, the thistle, you know, seed heads are flying up in the air and, and it's making you very happy doing it, you know, which is important. This is our experimental, uh, but obviously, yeah, I'm obviously setting up a straw house argument here, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, so we had, so we had a two year rotation for four years. So we had a wheat, essentially a wheat fallow rotation, either fallow, and the fallow could either be a fallow, just a, a black fallow or a fallow green manure with, uh, with uh, faba bean, Use fa using faba bean as a green manure planted either early or late or clover, where the clover was grow, was planted in the wheat crop, and then an early or a late termination. We had, we, the, the timings of these terminations, we don't have a long growing season. And then we also added clipping in as a treatment, a yes and no clipping treatment uh, was added in here as well. We didn't clip in the summer follow, of course, because, uh, because there was nothing we were following to do it. We weren't clipping it there. To do this, because I have research technicians that are wonderful research technicians, and they've been with me for years, and I don't want them to quit, I wasn't going to make them go out there and biomass Canada thistle, because I think, uh, because I anticipated if I would have done that, that they would have ended up quitting their jobs because you can't, you know, I think people have tried to do in the past, you know, you got to wear heavy coveralls and wear welding gloves when you're doing it. And it's, you know, no, it's, it's, it's just, no, like we have, to, we have some technology around this time. I was starting to get into crop imaging, imaging and lent and lentils in particular, uh, I mean, oh, lentils and uh, UAVs. And so we had a UAV. And so what we did is we, and, and, uh, and there'd been some work out of Denmark uh, with uh, Jesper Rasmussen, uh, who's a wonderful person who had shown that you could really identify thistles well in that by doing it. Anyways, we, Jan Ben developed a method to do this and we were able to do it. And what did we find out? So in the end, we found out that, that the clipping, essentially that the clipping didn't really work is what it would found out is that the clipping didn't really work in terms of the crop rotations. The only thing that really controlled the, the thistle was fallow, was having that fallow rotation, having tillage and also having the fab being late so we could get more tillage in the spring. Tillage was the only thing that did anything to reduce the area covered by the thistle. And the clipping made you feel good, but it didn't do that good. So in summary here, pretty simple summary. There's a key here. Seeding rate, increasing seeding rate works to increase the competitiveness of any crop. So it's a great organic thing. Timely rotary hoeing works for, if you can get in there for uh, drastically reduced populations of a small seeded weeds. Narrow row intero tillage can, uh, can supplement it, but not replace it. Uh, an above ground canopy clipping can reduce weed seed return in very short crops, but there's no, uh, but only in very short crops under our situation. We weren't able to make it work in cereals. This is our crew from back from when a lot of this research was done. There's Alex, Alex, Sean, where is Sean? Anyways, you guys, there are people that have done this. Yeah, that's some of the people that are funding me now. Uh, anyways, I'm open for questions, I think. I have a few minutes. Yeah. I've done harrowing in small grains, but not never rotary hoeing. My rule of thumb is typically waiting until the, uh, there's three true leaves on a cereal grain. Just wanted, maybe you mentioned it, but how deep are you planting the oats when you're rotary hoeing? And oh, we rotary hoe. We we don't look at the we don't look at the. We don't, we don't care about the. We found tolerance to be so good that we go whenever the weeds are there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, we rotary hoe at will, just based on just based on weed stage. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that like the, the, with the what's that? Okay, there was a question about there was a question about seating rate and lodging, uh, and as also and also about kind of this the spread within seed row spread by using an air seeder. Is that correct? Oh, even a lawn series. No, I haven't done any work in that. I think it's, it's, it, it makes sense to occupy more space. I know there's people like, like Jacob, Jacob Wiener from, uh, who's, well, who, who, who is it in Denmark, but he's actually from New York City originally. I thought he was Danish. But, <laughs> but uh, the, he's done a bit of work on that and found that, it, that, that there's advantages to that. Uh, in terms of lodging, that's something that, you know, we're, we don't, in Saskatchewan, our yield potentials don't usually get high enough that lodging is a problem under organic conditions. So we don't normally see it as a problem. Yeah. That, that does happen. As you get more plants in there, the stems get thinner and they fall down more. For any of our small grain growers, I'm curious if anyone's done higher seeding rates or rotary hoeing in the Midwest on cereal A question over there? Okay. Yeah, we're, we're typically planting as shallow as we can. We're planting between an inch and two inches. Yeah. Oh, is it? Okay, so we're planting to moisture, and sometimes in some years you're having to get it. So it's usually an inch to two inches. Actually, yeah. I was curious too about the yeah. planting gaps. I but, think that's going to be. But we haven't, we haven't seen a lot of, you know, like, you know, maybe it's just we, we're using a Yetter rotary hoe, a Mintil rotary hoe. We, we just have not seen in cereals stand reductions really. We've seen a little bit, but hardly anything. The weed control benefit is always vastly outweighed. Maybe our soils are more packed because they are, because we don't do as much inversion tillage, so that could be an issue. Our soils typically aren't really loose, you know? So if, it, if, you're, if, you've, you've, if you've moldboard plowed or done some deep inversion tillage, that will affect it. And, you know, obviously if you're seeing plants get kicked out, you know, like, you know, like, you know I'm not advocating that. This is under our situations, right? Yeah. No, no. Chisel plowing, like one chisel plow, the foul fall before, or two at the most. Yeah. Just a, as a light, a light field tillage. Yeah. A lot of this was done on a heavy, on, on a clay to clay loam, or a, a or a loam. Yeah. So we across the province, it varies from beach sand to heavy clay, so yeah. But this, this was mostly done on, this was mostly done on, on a clay loam soil. As we were seeing, you know, if we had to be at about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half deep in order to not start, you know, otherwise you'll see sand reduction from a, from yeah. a hole. Yeah, well that makes sense, yeah. And uh, yeah, our soils I think are a little bit more mellow than what you're dealing with, because we got more moisture and more our soils are often hard, like, you yeah. know, like physically hard, you know, like physically, especially if it's a dry spring, you know, you're not, you're not, you know, you're not, if, even if you drive a truck and you're not making a huge, huge, huge ruts. Yeah. Yeah. But we've had some success with it. I mean, I think there's potential there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this might be a question more for someone in the group rather than the professor from Canada. But why aren't we using fava beans in some in like a in a buckwheat summer cover? Well, why don't I hear more about using favas right where we're at? It, 
No, they, they tend not to. Fabas aren't, it's not my, we, I used to really love uh, field pea as, a, as an annual green manure crop. Uh, like that, that, that one that I showed you in the diet in that 4010, it, it was a monster, but we got so much trouble from using it as a green manure crop in our organic rotations. We select us, we, we built up too much root rot that we can't, we can't use, we can't grow field pea on that land anymore because there's just way too much of Phantomyces root rot. Is that? Uh, two years. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, a root rot, a phantomyces can stay, the French have recorded it up to 10 years after. Once you get, once you get an established, uh, once you get a bad infestation, an epidemic of a phantomyces root rot, it will, it basically eliminates you for out of field bee production for almost 10 years if you, if you have any moisture at all. We look for reduced tillage and control weeds. What kind of technique you think you do you want to try, you, you expect that could be a good control of the wheat no with less tillage? You know, I think, I think we're just on, you know, we, we had a great discussion around the table that where I was eating supper last night. You know, we're just, on, we're, just see, we're just at the inflection point of seeing really cool, smart weeders that were come to, come to it, right? You know, they, you know, they, all oh, my career, there's been talk of them. I have all these slides of, you know, prototypes and stuff like that. And some stuff is just finally starting to be delivered. If we can get it at reasonable prices, you know, like, you know, not hopefully less than a million dollars an implement or something, you know, for prices, and stuff like that, which, you know, yeah, yeah, that people can, yeah, that, uh, you know, I guess, you know, there are markets for that in ultra high value organic horticulture production, right? But for, you know, small grains, that's, you know, a lot of the, you know, and like some of the things like in small, you know, that, that people look at, you know, we looked at, you know, we've looked at herbicides and had some, you know, organic herbicides and, you know, had some success, but the, the cost of them were just like so crazy, you know, per acre that, you know, that, you know, to get less control than we could do it mechanically. So I didn't even present that stuff, yeah. Have you looked at seed singulation in the row and narrowing the rows up? There was a little research done in Vermont yeah. where they compared inner row cultivating with going down to four inch rows and they actually got a better weed control in flax going down to four inch rows than they did with 10 inch rows with cultivation. Uh, I haven't looked at it. I haven't looked at it uh, at all. I think, um, yeah, we just didn't have the equipment to look at it, yeah.